welcome, welcome, welcome. I have a great title today. You know, God always deals with me in titles. I'll sit at my desk and I won't get a Bible study. I won't get a message. I won't even hardly ever get a scripture before I get a title. And I was sitting at my desk and a children's song came into my spirit. Old MacDonald had a farm. E-I-E-I, old MacDonald had a farm. I'm, I'm hearing that in my spirit. And then I started to hear it a little clearer. And I heard Obadiah. Obadiah. And so I, I turned to Obadiah. But it wasn't the book. There, there are about 10 different Obadiahs listed in the Old Testament. Different ones. Different Obadiahs. And when I went to 1 Kings 18, I knew I was in the right place. My spirit lit up. Obadiah. And I read the story of Obadiah. And here's the title. Obadiah had alarm. <laughs> Obadiah had alarm. This is a, a, a great message from the Lord. And, and he gives me the titles to remember the word. I may not remember every detail about it, but I remember Obadiah had alarm. He was alarmed by something in his life, and yet he persevered through the alarm. See, I'll remember that forever. I'll remember last week's study. Uh, don't be a microwave chocolate chip. I'll remember things like Tobiah or not Tobiah. I'll, rec I'll know those scriptures. Always works in titles. So today's study is called Obadiah Had Alarm, and it's in 1 Kings 18. It had been three and a half years. This is the context, the setting. Three and a half years since it had rained in Israel. This was a disaster of epic proportions. This was not a mere matter of watering, not being able to water your lawn or make iced tea or fire up the hot tub or take a hot bath. This had nothing to do with the luxury of water. It was an issue of survival, of mere survival. There had been no rain for three and a half years. Crops, crops had long since died. And now both man and all the animals were in danger of dying themselves. And still the drought continued. This was a horrific moment in Israel's history. And as we see from chapter 17, the drought was brought on because of Israel's turning away from worshiping the true God. The physical drought was merely a reflection of the dry spiritual drought within the hearts of the people in Israel. And God allowed the drought to occur to draw attention to the drought, the dryness in the hearts of the nation of Israel. King Ahab and Queen Jezebel were on the throne at this time. Now, we know a lot about Ahab. We know a lot about Jezebel. Terrible, terrible, just mean, evil king and queen. Just evil. So let me just give you the scripture to set the scene. This is 1 Kings chapter 1, uh, chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. Now it happened after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah. In the third year, saying, okay, now go show yourself to Ahab, and I will now send rain on the face of the earth. So Elijah started out to go show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. Okay, listen to those words. The famine is severe in Samaria. So after three and a half years of hiding, because Elijah had made his initial prophecy to Ahab in front of him, and he said it to Ahab, this is what's going to happen. There's going to be no rain for three and a half years. And then Elijah went into hiding under the 
the command of the Lord. God told him to go hide. God even told him where to hide. And for three and a half years, he has been hiding. And now the time has come to end that three and a half years of hiding. He's now ordered to show himself each action of Elijah to go and hide and declare no rain and the one to come out and declare rain both required an amazing amount of faith on Elijah's part. An amazing amount. I mean, can you imagine being hidden for three and a half years so that no one would see your face? I mean, he was with, he, he knew where to hide and he had seen amazing miracles happen when he was hidden. And, but nobody, nobody could see him. He couldn't be, you know, go to Walmart. He, he couldn't go and buy groceries. I mean, he had to rely on someone to take care of him this whole time. What a lonely life that must have been, right? And yet he did it three and a half years. So he begins his journey out of hiding back to Ahab. But before we get there, I need to introduce you to Obadiah. This is the key character in this story. See, we always sort of focus on King Ahab and Queen Jezebel and on the prophet Elijah. They're the big guns in the story. But there's always a backstory, and there's always an unsung hero. And today his name is Obadiah. So this is 1 Kings chapter 18, the next two verses. We just read one and two. Here's three and four. Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the entire household of Ahab. Now, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. He was a believer in Yahweh. He was a believer in Jehovah God, the God of Israel. Here's how we know. God's not going to just tell us that he is. He's going to just tell us why we know he is. Now, Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for when Jezebel destroyed the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets of the Lord, the true God, and hid them by fifties in a cave. Fifty here, fifty here, and he provided for them bread and water. How long had this been going on? Three and a half years. Obadiah was taking care of hidden prophets with bread and water. How do you unknown, unseen feed a hundred men? Is that a great, how do you feed a hundred men bread for all that time without being seen or found out? But even more incredulous is the fact that he didn't just feed them bread, he fed them water. Didn't we just read that the drought was severe in Samaria? But somehow Obadiah found enough water all the time to keep a hundred prophets alive in caves with bread and water. This is an amazing, amazing servant of God. Obadiah, though, was in service to another king. He was over the household of Ahab, and yet, though he was in service to an evil king, this is where the rubber meets the road. He was in service to an earthly, worldly, evil boss, a non-believing boss. You are probably in a place in your life, if you work, you're in an office or a factory, you're somewhere with an unbelieving boss and unbelievers all around you. You may be the only Christian in the lot. You may be the only believer in the group. When I taught in Baltimore, I, I'm from Baltimore, outside of Baltimore, um, I taught in a private Jewish school. I was the only Gentile in the entire school. And it was a huge school. It was a preschool. And there were tw when I was there, 28 classes of two, three, four, and five-year-olds 
that meant 28 teachers and other staff members and the head of the school. And I was the only Gentile in the entire place. You might be the only Christian where you are. This is who Obadiah was. And Obadiah, who was in service to an evil king, also feared the Lord greatly. This reverence for the Lord had been demonstrated when he hid the prophets, when Jezebel wanted to kill them. This was treason in the sight of Jezebel and Ahab to take care of the prophets, to hide them. This was high treason against the state. And he disobeyed Jezebel by hiding the prophets of God. Now, this has nothing to do uh, I'm not here to tell you to disobey your boss or disobey your coworkers. This is this is a whole other side of that coin. All right. So let me read First Kings now, verses seven and eight. Let's move up the story. This is First Kings seven and eight. Now Obadiah was on his way to do what? F- probably feeding the prophets. Actually, not. He was actually on his way to look for water. Look for water. Well, here, I'll show you. So Abadiah, uh, Obadiah was on his way. Elijah met him, and he recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is this you, Elijah, my master? He said to him, It is I. Go say to your master, Behold, Elijah is here. What was happening was Ahab sent Obadiah to look for water. And uh, in the verse before, and, and so Ahab was going in this direction to look for water, and Obadiah was going in this direction to look for water. But we know that Obadiah already knew where water was. Because he, why? Because he had fed the prophets, the hidden prophets in the caves. So Obadiah has gone that way. Ahab has gone another way. And as Obadiah walks, he meets up with Elijah, and he recognizes who Elijah is. And he says, is this you, Elijah, my master? And he said to him, yeah, it's me. I'm back. Yay, I'm back. Woohoo! I'm back. Go say to your master, Ahab, behold, Elijah is here. Elijah had just come from a special time of special preparation in solitude with the Lord. He was staying with the widow. He had seen the widow's son raised from the dead. And when the Lord commanded him to go and speak to the king, he was ready to go. If you Imagine being in the presence of a resurrection that you saw by your prayer and the power of God, someone coming alive from the dead. I mean, that would empower you and say, yes, send me to my enemies. Send me to King Ahab. Send me, Lord. And he was fired up inside because he had witnessed this great miracle of God. But Obadiah, what is Obadiah going to do? It was different with Obadiah. He was the servant of an unbelieving king who was in the huge throes in the midst of idolatry. And though he endured in his faith, Obadiah did. He had likely been without fellowship or encouragement of other believers. Maybe there were a handful in the kingdom that Obadiah could whisper, I love God. I love God too. But there weren't many. And he was surrounded with King Ahab and Queen Jezebel and unbelievers. Elijah had been declared public enemy number one. And there was a warrant out for his arrest. His picture is on the most wanted posters throughout the land. And now Elijah is back, and Elijah wants Obadiah to announce that he's back. Can you imagine how that must have quaked Obadiah, knowing that he served a very volatile king and a queen who hated Elijah, hated him with an evil, malevolent hate? And Elijah says to Obadiah, do me a favor. Will you just go tell the king that that I'm back? It would enrage the king. 
And Obadiah was fearful for his own life, fearful of what might come if he did that. But Elijah recognizes this. And in verse 15 of chapter 18 of 1 Kings, here Elijah speaking into Obadiah. Elijah says, As the Lord of hosts live, Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, before whom I stand, I will surely present myself to him today. What Elijah is saying is, you can count on me to not leave you alone. You can count on me to be there when, when Ahab comes looking. I will show myself to him today. The emphasis here is, you can count on me because I'm counting on the Lord. This is the great promise. Elijah has been with the Lord. He's been empowered by God, and he says, As the Lord of hosts live... Who are the hosts? Well, the Bible talks about the starry hosts being the entire, the stellar, the stars, the moon, the sun. But the angels are always are also called the hosts of heaven. And so what Elijah says is, I have been in fellowship with the God of it all, the God of everything. I have been ministered to by that very God. I have stood in his presence before whom I stand. And Ahab says, I surely will do what he told me to do. And I guarantee you, Obadiah, will be fine. See, Obadiah had alarm. He was fearful for his own life. Obadiah had alarm. But guess what happened next? So verses 16 through 18 of 1 Kings 18. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Now it sounds so, I guarantee you that Ahab did not say, oh, great, let's go meet in the meadow. Let's just bring some daisies along and a peace offering. No. This picture is much different. And then it happened when Ahab, here's where it changes. Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said to him, is that you, O troubler of Israel? And Elijah answered, I've not troubled Israel. You and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Now, remember three and a half years ago, Ahab was told by Elijah, there's going to be a drought in the land because of what's going on in your kingdom. And so after three and a half years, Elijah comes back. Obadiah has told Ahab, Elijah wants to see you. Elijah's back. Ahab's fired up. Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And here is Elijah's peaceful response. All of this, all of this drought, all of this misery, all of this hurt, it's your fault. It's your fault and your father's fault. It's all on you, Ahab. What do you think Ahab's response was going to be. Certainly not a pleasant one. And you can just see Obadiah over there going, oh no, oh no, oh no. Don't do it, Elijah. Don't do it, Elijah. Oh, Elijah, don't. no, don't do it. I mean, I can see Obadiah. I can just see him standing off in, in, in a not too far distant uh, place of hiding, like behind a wall or behind a, a curtain, just sort of coward, waiting for this exchange between Ahab and Elijah. And Elijah comes out firing with like two guns blazing. And he just, he doesn't pull any punches. And he comes out and he says, Ahab, I don't trouble Israel. You're the reason why there's all this trouble. You are the reason. It was after this that Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal. Remember this? The story, you have to read it if, if you haven't seen it already or read it or, or don't remember it. So they challenge one another to a fire duel. 
Now remember, there's drought in the land. There's a severe drought in Samaria. And so everything should be tender, fire ready. I mean, there's nothing that's, that is green in, in regard to fire and lumber and fire starters. And everything is so dry, dry grass, dry everything. And so Elijah confronts the Baals, the, the, the prophets of Baal and say, start a fire and call down your gods. Call down Baal and, and let's see what he does. Well, they put everything together. Now they don't light the fire because they're waiting for the fire from Baal to come down. And the prophets of Baal, friends of Ahab, start whirling and twirling and dancing with all of their might around this fire pit, waiting for fire to start. Doesn't start. Hour after hour after hour after hour, they continue to dance and cry out and scream and yell and sing and dance and parade and like a whirling dervish and still no fire. They finally give up and they go, Elijah, you try it. You probably can't do any better than we did. So Elijah says, I'll try it, but I want you to do something before I do. Go get water and pour it on all the dry tinder stuff. Pour as much water on as we can get. And so they found water. That's God. God always provides in the desert. Amen. And all of a sudden, there was a whole bunch of water that they could take out and dump onto all of this fire-ready tinder. Elijah says, God, you're the only God. I know you promised. Let them see the power of God. And what does God do? Sends down fire and consumes all that they had done in that fire pit. And Elijah, believing that he has just shown off for God, where God has just shown off for him, he doesn't get all pumped up. In fact, he does the opposite because now Jezebel is even hotter than she was. And Elijah takes off and he runs. Leaving who? Obadiah. Poor Obadiah. But he's not by himself. He has a hundred prophets he's been taking care of. See, this is what God's talking to me about. Now, I have, I understand that I'm in a place that you are not because I have the great ability to surround myself with believers in my ministry. You know, my 90% of my job is inside of churches or inside a conference. Uh, I, I'm, I'm sort of surrounded, but I do shop at places that are not spirit-filled. I buy groceries, and I'm out in the world a lot. I travel, so I'm out a lot, and I meet people a lot in restaurants. and So I'm in the world. And here's what God is speaking to us. While we should not enter into judgment with those who work in non-believing situations. We, we, there's no, we can't judge. You have to be a worker in this world. You have to do. But it's possible that even though you're in that awkward position, you can still serve your heavenly Father. You see, Obadiah, though he was in a horrible situation, did not leave his heavenly father out of the equation. He didn't leave him at home. He continued to serve God in the worst of circumstances, in the hardest of situations, at the peril of his own life. Obadiah stood and still loved and served God. The Lord still works that way today. He is the God who provides for you. But he does not always provide by sending ravens like he did for Elijah or miraculously extending a supply of water and flour. More often than not, God supplies through an Obadiah. You are the Obadiahs in the world. Those of you who work outside of ministry, you are the blessed Obadiahs in this world. You are the one willing to be an instrument for God wherever you are. And that's the story of Obadiah. 
this is the story that God supplied in an ungodly place through a godly person, through a believer. And this is what God is speaking. You may have the worst work environment, but you can still be God's in that work environment. You might have the world's worst boss, but you can still be God's vessel in that place. And here's what he's calling us to do, to be God's, God's vessel in restaurants and stores and businesses in airports. He, he's calling us to be the Obadiahs, to supply needs, to be the witness, to be faithful in serving him. This is what God's asking for us, is for us to all to be Obadiahs in the world. It's not comfortable. It's not going to be easy. You may be mocked. You may be made fun of. You may be um, abused. You may be discriminated against. But God's saying, I, I need Obadiahs. I need Obadiahs in this world. I need Obadiahs in my kingdom. So here's my challenge. Will you step up wherever you are, whatever you do? Will, will you be an Obadiah where you are, in your family, in your job, in a restaurant, in a store, at the peril of your own life? Well, the world needs us. God needs us to be in this world as Obadiahs. So would you step up? This is what I wrote. Would you step up to where you work, where you live, where you go to be an Obadiah? Now, Obadiah had alarm, but Obadiah had God's arm, his strong and mighty arm, to take care of him and provide for him. So yes, we have alarm in this world, but we have God's arm and God's strong and mighty hand to protect us, to take care of us, to guide us, to protect us, and to empower us. If you do not know this God, oh, he's such a great God, and he wants a relationship with you, so much so that he is painting every part of your life together, hopefully with his, one brush trip at a time. God bless you. Thank you for watching today's program, One Brush Stroke at a Time. If you have been blessed by this study, would you share your story with us? We want to hear how God is moving in hearts all around the globe. If you have a question, would like more information, or would like to request prayer, please visit our website at brushstrokeministries.com or connect with us on Facebook at Brushstroke Ministries. You may also contact us at Brushstroke Ministries, P.O. Box 2353, Buchanan, West Virginia, 26201. Join Jenny Fister every week at this time to hear a fresh revelation as she paints a beautiful picture of his word, one brushstroke at a time.